Окей. Так, окей, let's start. So today is our last lecture, last lecture in this semester, and it will be dedicated to the lymphoid system. Lymphoid system. So uh, lymphoid system, what is it? Yes, well, lymphoid system is a part of cardiovascular system, which complements venous system. So uh, blood flows from the heart, we told about it, through the arteries. And then it returns through the veins. But we will later um, say that not all the blood can return through the veins that left the heart through the arteries. So capacity of the veins is less than capacity of the arteries. And that's, that's why we have another additional complementary part of venous system, that is lymphoid system. And at our practical classes, we actually discussed, you, uh, some of you asked me, what is actually a uh, lymphoid system? And uh, where is the immune system and anatomy? And I told you that if immune system is more physiological term. In anatomy, we don't have immune system. And so lymphoid system is an anatomic equivalent of immune system. Uh, and in many literature sources, you uh, saw that this system is actually named lymphatic. But um, according to the last anatomic nomenclature, uh, system is named lymphoid. So it is more correct term than lymphatic system. So in anatomy, we will say lymphoid, not lymphatic. Please memorize it. Uh, lymphoid system performs many functions. And so, yes, one of them is fluid balance and then lipid absorption. Uh, lymphocyte development and immune response. So these are physiological functions of lymphoid system. In the case of a pathology, uh, lymphoid system starts to perform some other functions. And the most, um, the saddest, I think, let's say so, of them, it is spreading of metastasis. So when we have a malignant tumor, a cancer, first of all, such tumors, such malignant cells start to spread via the lymphatic vessels because they have higher permeability than blood vessels. And so um, metastasis, um, spreading of metastasis is another pathological function of lymphoid system. Uh, within the lymphoid system, the following parts are distinguished. So first of all, these are lymphatic vessels. And just like blood vessels, they are different according to the size and the structure. There are the smallest one, they are lymphatic capillaries. Then lymphatic capillaries uh, continue to the lymphatic vessels, which uh, go to the lymphatic trunks and the lymphatic trunks end with the lymphatic ducts. And there are two lymphatic ducts, thoracic and right, and both of them drain to the venous angle, Piragov's angle, place of the junction of subclavian vein and internal jugular vein, so at the place of the formation of um, brachiocephalic vein. And there are also lymphatic organs. Uh, we have already studied them uh, in as other systems, just to their anatomic proximity. But here they are, like there are primary lymphoid organs. They are cymos and also bone marrow, this primary. And there are the others, such as lymph nodes, spleen, and tonsils. So cymos and bone marrow are considered to be primary immune organs or lymphoid organs, because uh, they are the organs we are Lymphatic cells are formed. They are formed from the stem cells. In all the other organs, these lymphatic cells undergo maturation. So they come here, these lymphatic cells, they are still young, but they are already lymphatic. They are already differentiated. And in lymph nodes and spleen and in the tonsils, they undergo maturation, but they are not formed. Yes, so that's why they are secondary uh, lymphoid or immune organs. So we have to know what is the difference between blood and lymph circulation. So blood circulation consists of arteries, veins, and there are blood capillaries between them. And when we study some organs such as kidney, for example, or liver, yes, we said that um, there are some miraculous networks where capillaries 
uh, which are formed from the arteries, they can become arteries again, like in the kidney, it is a miraculous network of the kidney, or in the liver, it's vice versa, from the veins, from portal vein is forms its own branches, and it forms capillaries, um, and then capillaries become again veins. This is a miraculous network of the liver. Uh, in the limb circulation, there are lymphatic capillaries and lymphatic vessels. Um, and if we compare direction of flowing of liquid inside in the blood vessels, then it is circular, yes? Uh, blood flows both towards the heart and away from the heart. Like for the animals, for the highest animals, including humans, so cardio, this blood circulation, it is circulation, yes, it is closed. And in lymph circulation, lymph flows only towards the heart. So lymph capillaries, we will later say about it, they start blindly. There is blind end of the lymphatic capillary. It starts and then it moves to larger and larger vessels. And finally, it drains into the venous angle. So speed of flowing of the liquid is different. So in blood vessels, it's much faster and it reaches 10 to 20 centimeters per second. And in lymph, lymph flows very slowly. It is about 25 to 30 centimeters per minute. And we can, we actually might see it when there is a very superficial injury of any part of our body, when there is no bleeding, we can see that a small amount of transparent fluid um, appears on the surface of the wound that is the lymph. And we can see that lymph is accumulated in this wound very slowly, unlike the blood. Blood comes very fast. Yes, so it's due to the differences of speed of flowing of lymph and blood in both blood and lymphatic vessels. Yes. So a composition of the blood, you actually studied it in histology. Yes. And in at school. Yes, I think. So we know that blood includes plasma and uh, blood cells. And these blood cells, they are RBCs, erythrocytes, WBCs, leukocytes, and platelet cells or thrombocytes. And the lymph contains also plasma, and it contains only lymphocytes. That's why color of the blood is red due to the presence of erythrocytes, yes. And lymph, it can be from transparent to such a milky color. Uh, because it doesn't contain erythrocytes and it contains only one type of leukocytes that is lymphocytes and uh, blood vessels they are not interrupted yes so like blood flows without any interruptions along the vessels and lymphatic vessels they are interrupted by lymph nodes how exactly we will also talk about it later so what is the lymph we actually said about it a little bit, but now we will talk about it in detail. So uh, as we said, it is tissue fluid or interstitial fluid that enters the lymphatic vessels. When we studied cardiovascular system, we said that uh, there are some differences in the structure of artery and vein. And we, we are saying that wall of the artery is much thicker than the wall of the vein, but anyway, there are many layers. Uh, there is a definite amount of layers, let's say so, um, and permeability of arteries and the uh, veins is not very high. It is not very high. Uh, so blood capillaries, they are formed by one layer of endotheliocytes, which usually lie on the basement membrane. Yes, and in case of sinusoid of the liver, for example, there is not basement membrane. And we said that permeability of sinusoid is much higher than permeability over um, of unusual capillary. Yes, and so when blood reaches bl um, this capillary, like microcirculatory stream, we can call it microcirculatory stream, capillaries, uh, plasma starts to pass through the walls of the capillary and go to the interstitial space, intercellular space, uh, together with nutrients, together with oxygen, so plasma, but without blood cells. And this is interstitial fluid. And from this interstitial fluid, cells take oxygen and they take nutrients 
And uh, after that, the interstitial fluid should return back to the veins. And so about 20 liters of fluid pass from the blood capillaries into the interstitial species each day. There is only 17 liters pass from the interstitial species back into the blood capillaries. So that's, uh, I told you, it's because um, capacity of the veins is uh, slightly less than capacity of the arteries. And so this excessive amount of the interstitial fluid uh, starts to move along the lymphatic vessels. And so lymphatic, but here you can see it, yes? So along the lymphatic vessels. And first of all, it enters the lymphatic capillary. So this is a lymphatic capillary. We can see that it has blind end. And uh, also the wall of lymphatic capillary is formed by endothelial cell endothelial cells without a basement membrane and gaps between these uh, endothelial cells are rather big. So that's why permeability of lymphatic capillary is higher than permeability of blood capillary and interstitial fluid easily enters lymphatic capillary. So this excessive amount, three liters move through the lymphatic capillary. So what exactly can enter the lymphatic capillary? Water, of course, yes, substances of plasma, ions, nutrients, gases, some proteins, uh, hormones, enzymes, waste products derived from the cells within the tissues, and also blood cells, lymphocytes, monocytes, granulocytes. But we have already said that interstitial fluid does not contain, in normal cases, these cells, yes? So these um, cells, uh, lymphocytes, monocytes, and granulocytes, they enter lymph from the lymph node, which in the, which are located on the way of lymphatic vessels. So these lymphocytes, they uh, undergo maturation in the lymphatic nodes, and after that, they leave it into the lymphatic vessel. That's how it happens. So that is the exact uh, scheme, exact scheme, it's scheme of the flowing of the lymph through the lymphatic Vessel. So first lymphatic capillary, then vessel, and vessel can be interrupted by lymph node. And so again, vessel, then all the vessels, they, they drain vessels of one region, one part of the body, let's say so. They join each other and they form lymphatic trunk. Lymphatic trunks join and they form collecting duct, which are two, yes, that is a thoracic lymphatic duct and right lymphatic duct, and both of them drain into subclavian vein, or in some books it's written that they drain into the venous angle between um, subclavian vein and internal jugular vein. So, okay, uh, lymphatic capillaries, here you can see it. Uh, as I have already told you, the main feature of lymphatic capillary, it is blind end. So it starts from nothing, yes? And then the wall of lymphatic capillary is formed by a single layer of overlapping endothelial cells without basement membrane, without basement membrane. So it is more permeable than uh, that, than the wall of the blood capillary. And uh, yes, not um, lymphatic capillaries are not present everywhere. Uh, they are absent in such structures as tunics of an eyeball, lens, placenta, splenic pulp, cartilages, epithelial layers of mucosa, and epidermal layer of the skin. Uh, before it was considered that in the brain lymphatic capillaries are also absent, but recently, uh, recent investigations confirmed that there are lymphatic capillaries in the brain and in the meninges. Yes, so the absence of the lymphatic capillaries in tunics of an eyeball, for example. Yes, uh, okay, yes, uh, Mohammed, uh, you are asking about drainage of the lymphatic duct. Yes, lymphatic ducts drain into subclavian vein, and at this place, lymph joins uh, the venous blood, and like it's... Um, slightly dilute, dilutes it, let's say, so dissolves it a little bit, like just join venous blood, 
because it's just, it's nothing but plasma and lymphocytes. Yes. Okay, so the fact of the absence of the lymphatic capillaries uh, in such um, structures as tunic of an eyeball, for example, makes for us possible to make an allergenic transplantation of these um, structures. What means allergen uh, allergenic? It means we can transplant cornea, for example, from another person to from one person to another person without a comparison of the genes because there will be no immune response in the cornea because there are no lymph capillaries uh, there and lymphatic capillaries which and there are also no blood vessels actually in the cornea so the absence of lymphatic capillaries makes possible to perform transplantation of the structures from one to another person without a probability of rejection reaction let's say so yes okay uh, we uh, remember when we studied intestines we said that the wall the mucosa of small intestine contains intestinal villi yes and inside this intestinal villi, there were blood capillaries and there was also lactyl. So lactyl is um, one of the types of the lymphatic capillary. It is lymphatic capillary, but it is located in the intestinal villus. And the main function of this lactyl is to absorb lipids. So um, certainly small molecules of lipids yes uh, so carbohydrates i mean glucose yes fructose they are absorbed into the blood capillary and as well as proteins i mean amino acids they also um, absorbed into the blood capillary but lipids are always firstly absorbed into the lymphatic capillary into the lacteals so lactyls pick up not only interstitial fluid, but also dietary lipids and lipid-soluble vitamins. And when, after the meal, after the intake of the food, when absorption of lipids starts by lactyls, lymph of this region, of this area, has a milky color due to the presence of lipids. And that's why it can also be called chyle. Kyle. Okay, that is a lactyl. Uh, after the entrance of the lymph into the lymphatic capillary, uh, it continues flowing and it gets into the lymphatic vessels. So lymphatic vessels, the wall of the lymphatic vessels is very similar with the wall of the vein. And so it has three layered wall, but still it is thinner than the wall of the vein. And it also has valves, and they are even more numerous than valves in the vein. And if vein is not interrupted by anything, yes, then lymphatic vessels, they are interrupted by lymph nodes at the intervals. And just like veins, they are arranged into superficial and deep sets. So that fact that wall of the lymph is much, oh, sorry, a wall of the lymphatic vessel is it has some sad consequences for us as medical students, yes? Uh, that's why it's very complicated to find lymphatic vessels in our preparations because they are very... And so that is why, because wall of the lymphatic vessel is thinner even than the wall of the vein, we don't often see uh, lymphatic vessels in our preparations. So because they are very fragile yes okay uh, and so after that from the lymphatic vessels lymph goes to the uh, lymphatic trunks uh, so uh, they are not so many <coughs> they are not so many so uh, jugular trunk is that trunk that collects lymph from the head and there are right and left jugular trunks which collect lymph from the right and left head and neck, sorry, from the right and left parts of head and neck. And then there are uh, subcleaving trunks which collect lymph from the upper limbs, and they are also right and left. Yes, and there is bronchomediastinal trunk 
uh, right and left also, which contains or which collects lymph from the corresponding part of the mediastinum and also plural, like lungs and plura, plura uh, of the corresponding part and um, bronchomediastinal, yes. And uh, there are also right and left lumbar trunks, which collect lymph from lower limbs and from the walls of the pelvic and abdominal cavity. And there is intestinal trunk, here we can see it, intestinal trunk, which collects lymph from the uh, digestive organs. So uh, right and left lumbar trunks together with intestinal trunk, they join together and they form thoracic lymphatic duct that starts with cisterna heli, with this uh, dilation, cisterna heli, and after that it continues upward. Okay. There are, as I have already told you, there are two ducts, right and left lymphatic ducts. So right lymphatic duct uh, is much smaller than the thoracic one, and it collects lymph only from uh, right part of head and neck, and from right upper limb, and so from the right part of the thoracic cavity. So it's formed by the union of right jugular, right subclavian, and right bronchomediastinal trunk. Here you can see it. So it is very small, and it ends by entering the right venous angle. Right venous angle. Okay. Thoracic duct begins in front of the first lumbar vertebra uh, as a dilated sac, cisterna heli. So as I have already told you, it is formed by left and right lumbar trunks and intestinal trunk. And so it enters thoracic cavity through the opening, uh, through the aortic hiatus, yes. And it ascends, travels upward. So then it turns to the left and it also drains into the left venous angle. So it turns to the left at the level of the T5. And after that, it turns, uh, yes, even laterally uh, at the beginning of the neck and descends to enter the left venous angle. But before entering the left venous angle, uh, there are some more tributaries for the thoracic lymphatic duct, they are left jugular, left subclavian, and left bronchomediastinal trunks. So if to compare, yes, um, regions of drainage for the right and for thoracic lymphatic duct, as I told you, a right lymphatic duct receives lymph from the right half of the head and neck, from the right upper limb, right lung, right side of the heart, and right surface of the liver. So like one quarter of the lymph, it drains through the um, right lymphatic duct. Thoracic lymphatic duct drains lymph from the lower limbs, pelvic cavity, uh, abdominal cavity, left side of the thorax, left side of the head, neck, and the left upper limb. So for the thoracic lymphatic duct, it is um, three quarters. So these are three quarters, much larger than for the right lymphatic duct. Okay. So what are the lymphatic cells, which are also known as lymphoid cells? And it, actually lymphoid cells, it is more correct, yes? Uh, they are located in both lymphatic system and cardiovascular system. They work together to accomplish an immune response. And there are the following types of lymphatic cells. Uh, macrophages and epithelial cells, dendritic cells, and lymphocytes. So actually, I think you studied all of the things at your histology classes. So you know that macrophages, they accomplish phagocytosis. So they just eat foreign body, yes. And then lymphocytes, they can provide cellular and humoral immunity. Um, cellular and humoral immunity, both. And so they can uh, form antibodies. You have understood this thing, yes. Uh, yes, uh, now about lymphoid organs, uh, that's what we have already said, that primary uh, lymphoid organs, they are red bone marrow and thymus, because formation of lymphatic cells occurs there, and secondary organs where just maturation on lymphatic cells occurs, these are lymph nodes, lymph nodules, and uh, spleen. So lymph nodes, lymph nodes are uh, can have different shape. They can be small, 
uh, yes, um, they can, they not can be, they are always small. Uh, they can be round or oval, and they are located um, along the pathways of lymphatic vessels, and their length can vary from 1 to 25 millimeters, and usually they are found in clusters, though we can have also solitary lymph nodes, like, for example, in the mucosa of jejunum, yes? So they receive lymph from many body regions, and uh, they are also found individually uh, throughout the body tissue. So solitary lymph nodes are also present. So uh, what can we see? This is a lymph node. So uh, usually, uh, yes, being shaped. Uh, there are efferent vessels, so the, those vessels, lymphatic vessels, which bring lymph inside the lymph node, uh, they are efferent vessels, and they enter at the periphery of lymph node. There are also efferent lymph vessels, which emerge at the hilum here. They are arranged in groups along the blood vessels or the um, concave side of the joint, flexural side of the joint, so inside, yes, uh, like, yes, concave side. And they are divided into superficial and deep groups. So a lymph passes, lymph enters through the efferent lymphatic vessels, passes through the lymph node, and also I think you studied it in histology that there is cortex and there is medulla, yes, and so along the sinuses lymph passes, and while it passes through the lymph node, it mm, collects lymph nodes, oh sorry, it collects lymphocytes, and that's why that lymph that passes through efferent uh, lymphatic vessels. It has much higher concentration of lymphocytes than that one that enters through efferent lymphatic vessels. So cortex is the peripheral part. Consists of numerous lymphoid follicles which mostly contain B lymphocytes. And we know that B lymphocytes are responsible for the humoral immunity. Yes, they produce like this B lymphocytes, they produce antibodies. Okay. Uh, after that, there is paracortex. Here we can see it between cortex and medulla. It is like T-dependent zone. It contains mostly T cells. And T cells, they are responsible for the cellular immunity. So they also accomplish uh, phagocytosis. Yes? And then medulla. Medulla consists of medullary cords and medullary sinuses. So medullary cords, are, here we can see them, medullary cords, and uh, they are filled in with B cells and plasma cells. And medullary sinuses are just passages for the lymph. So what's the difference? Uh, what's the difference between uh, T lymphocytes and macrophages. Uh, we said that macrophages, they also accomplish phagocytosis. But macrophages, they provide non-specific immunity. Like macrophag macrophages, they see something foreign. They are not interested what is it, but they just see it as foreign. And they start destroying it. So they destroy it, they study it, and after that, they perform antigen presentation. So they um, expose on the cellular membrane a part, an antigen, a part of this foreign body, and uh, they teach, they teach lymphocytes that this is foreign. And lymphocytes, they study, and they start to proliferate. And very many lymphocytes who, are, who just know that this is foreign, this particular something is foreign, like it is a line of lymphocytes, it is produced and they go to the bloodstream and they find this particular foreign body and they kill it. Uh, this is specific immunity, yes? So macrophages, they provide non-specific immunity. And in average, they can kill only up to 20 foreign bodies during their life. Uh, lymphocytes, they provide specific immunity, T lymphocytes. And they can kill up to 200 foreign bodies during their lives. Uh, 
So specific immunity is much better than non-specific. Okay, now we should talk about regional lymphatic drainage. Uh, first of all, we should know about regional lymphatic drainage from the mammary gland. Um, from the lateral part of the mammary gland, lymphatic drainage goes to the axillary lymph nodes and the very first lymph node where lymphatic drainage goes from the lateral part of the mammary gland, it is Zorgius lymph node. Uh, here we can see it. It is sentinel lymph node for the mammary gland. What does it mean? It is the very first lymph node where metastasis, these malignant cells, can spread in case of the malignant tumor. Yes? So regional lymph node is the lymph node where the lymph of the organ or part of the body drainages to firstly. So if there is a tumor in the mammary gland, we first of all check the sentinel lymph node and if there is nothing inside, like if it, it's healthy, there is no pathology, it means there are no metastases. If there is something inside, then we should continue studying, we should check further located, more distantly located lymph nodes for the presence of metastasis. So there are many different groups of lymph nodes, like they get their names due to their location, like there are axillary nodes in the axillary cavity, inguinal nodes uh, along the inguinal fold, yes, um, there are cervical nodes at the region of the neck, and so on. Yes, and so yes, you have to know for now, you have to know just the main groups of lymph nodes. That will be quite enough for the um, anatomy course. When we study top anatomy, we certainly will study it much deeper and we will study um, lymphatic drainage from all the organs. But for now, it is enough. Okay, and we will also we should also say a few words about these lymphoid organs. Uh, actually, we have already studied it. Yes. So first, spleen. Uh, spleen is located in the left hypochondric region, and its skeletotope it is located between uh, the ninth and eleventh ribs in the line of the tenth rib, and it is the largest lymphoid organ in the body, and it can vary considerably in size and weight, in size and weight. So the mean, okay, you can see it. Uh, there are many functions of the spleen. Yes, it is immune organ. So maturation of B lymphocytes takes place here. But we also studied at school that it is like a um, graveyard, graveyard of erythrocytes. Yes. So after erythrocytes, when erythrocytes are about to end their life, as they come here to the spleen, they stuck between uh, septs. Uh, of the spleen, and so they undergo necrosis here. Yes, apoptosis. They undergo apoptosis here. So about the anatomy, you know that just like in the liver, there is diaphragmatic surface and visceral surface, and at the visceral surface of the spleen, there is a hilum through which um, arteries and nerves enter, splenic artery and uh, nerves, they enter, and vein leaves and lymphatic vessels also leave, yes. And so if we are talking about internal structure of the spleen, uh, yes, it is covered by connective tissue capsule and from its capsule inside inward, the parenchyme of the spleen, trabeculae, connective septs enter and they divide the parenchyme of the spleen into some kind of lobules. Yes, and here uh, two main parts are distinguished, that is red pulp and white pulp. And so red pulp, as always, is named red due to the presence of erythrocytes. And in the white pulp, there are no erythrocytes. That's why it has white color. Oh, okay, sorry. <clears throat> A white color. And so here in, in the white pulp, white pulp is presented by periarterial lymphatic sheath. Uh, yes. And there are also marginal zone where there are germinal centers uh, where lymphocytes, they undergo maturation. Maturation. So mainly function of the white pulp, it is maturation of B lymphocytes. And for the red pulp, uh, the main function Mm, it is like 
to provide biodegradation of erythrocytes, let's say so. Okay, so Simos. Simos, we also have talked about it uh, when we studied respiratory system. It is primary immune organ and it is located in the superior mediastinum, in the superior interpleural area, if to be more precise. And the features, uh, it consists of two lobes, elongated lobes, and uh, it, it has the largest sizes in the fetus, and with the time it undergoes involution, age involution, and before it was actually considered that in adult people it doesn't function at all, but now it is proved that thymus continues functioning even um, in LDH, but just most part of it is substituted by fatty tissue, but some part of thymus is still present uh, here. So, is still present and still continues functioning. Okay, so it occupies thoracic cavity behind the sternum and it secretes lymphopoietin, but it's not the only thing. And here we can see that uh, as any parenchymous organ, it is also covered by, surrounded by capsule, and from the capsule inside the parenchyme of the thymus, connective tissue saps enter, and they divide thymus, parenchyme of the thymus, into the lobules. And in the lobule of the thymus, there is cortex, the uh, peripheral part, it is cortex, and there is internal part, it is medulla. And so the main functions of thymus, it is production of hormones, which are thymoline, thymopoietin, and thymosine, which stimulate formation of lymphatic cells, yes, and also positive and negative selection of T lymphocytes. So positive selection takes place in the cortex of lobule, and the negative selection takes place inside the medulla. So how exactly does it work? Uh, stem cells, ancestors, let's say so, like, yes, stem cells from the bone marrow, which are later will become T lymphocytes, they come into the thymus, into the cortex, into the peripheral part, yes? And here, uh, there are also dendritic cells, which start teaching, which start teaching T, T lymphocytes. And while teaching, they check if they are actually capable to study or not. And most of them are not capable, as it actually is always, yes? And what does it mean capable? It means if they are able to um, provide immune response, yes? So uh, they, this dendritic cell, they show them something and those cells who are able to provide immune response, like it is cell immunity, like to eat them, yes, uh, they stay, they survive. And so it means that they passed positive selection. Uh, those who are unable to kill anybody, they are killed themselves. So they uh, undergo apoptosis because we do not need those who are unable to study, right, in our body. And so those who are able, they go to the second stage. And this is negative selection. Now, uh, they should be checked if they actually understand whom they should kill and whom they should not to prevent autoimmune pathology, autoimmune, yes, to prevent such a disease which causes a killing of our own cells. That's why at this stage in the medulla, yes, uh, this um, T lymphocytes, dendritic cells, they show the T lymphocytes our own cells and they check if they start to kill them or not. And if they start to kill our own cells, they also get destroyed. So, and those who do not, they pass negative selection. And by this way, uh, in the thymus, the best, only the best T lymphocytes stay, 
which are able to kill and which understand whom exactly they should kill. Yes, those which will not kill our own cells. And only these cells can pass through hematothymic barrier that is located in the border between cortex and medulla, and they can enter the bloodstream. So I think it's a very good way to study. If you are unable to study, we don't need you, right? That is good. I hope somebody is still with me. Oh my God. Okay, so lymphatic nodules, that is the other uh, lymphoid organ. Uh, they, these are oval clusters of lymphatic cells with some extracellular matrix, which are not surrounded by a connective tissue Nice, thank you. By a connective tissue capsule. So they filter and attack uh, antigens. And in some areas of the body, many lymphatic, vas uh, many lymphatic nodules group together to form uh, larger structures. Uh, so uh, these lymphatic nodules, they form mucosa associated lymphatic tissue, melt, or tonsils, or tonsils. So they are very prominent in the mucosa of small intestine, especially in the ileum. So they form here pierce patches, these lymphatic nodules. And they are also present in the appendix. Okay. So what is mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue? When we studied the whole digestive tract, and not only, actually the respiratory tract as well, we said that in the mucosa always there are these lymphatic nodules. So, for example, these are pierced patches, tonsils, uh, appendix in the digestive tract. So, lymphoid nodules in the walls of the bronchi. Uh, so, this melt protects the digestive and respiratory systems from foreign bodies. From foreign bodies. So, they are numerous and they are present all over the digestive and respiratory tract. So, they are uh studied together and they are known as melt because associated lymphatic tissue tonsils are a little bit different thing yes we studied tonsils these are clusters of lymphatic cells and extracellular matrix not completely surrounded by a connective tissue capsule and so they consist of multiple germinal centers and creeps Several groups of tonsils form a protective ring around the pharynx, Valdez ring. And you remember certainly that Valdez ring includes pharyngeal tonsil or adenoids uh, in nasopharynx and palatine tonsils in oral cavity and lingual tonsils along the posterior one third of the tongue uh, in the root of the tongue, yes, and tubal tonsils uh, at the torus tubarius behind pharyngeal opening of the eustachian tube. Actually, we studied it in details when we studied digestive systems. These tonsils, yes, I hope you still remember it. So all, both of the structures, melt and tonsils, they belong to lymphoid nodules. And so one more thing which we are going to study, which we are going to discuss today, it actually doesn't quite belong to a uh, lymphoid system, it is breast or mammary gland. So you, it is like a derivative of the skin, a derivative of the dome, sorry. So this is modified sweat glands of the skin and it is functional or in females, so especially during lactation, in the postpartal period after the childbirth, it starts, they start to secrete milk. Yes, produce and yes, secrete, okay. And uh, in males, there is also breast, but they are rudimentary and functionless in males, but still they are present. So uh, they are hemispherical in shape, and they extend uh, vertically, it is from the second to the sixth rib, and horizontally from the lateral margin of the sternum to the mid-axillary line. And two-thirds of the mammary gland lies in the superficial fascia, uh, lying on the pectoralis major muscle, and one-third uh, one of the breast lies on the serratus anterior muscle. So this is, uh, here you can see sagittal section of the mammary gland. It consists of 18 to 20 lobules and they are cone-shaped as these lobules and uh, they continue to the mammary duct first and after that 
uh, this memory duct continues to the lactiferous duct, which has a dilation uh, or an ampulla, and this lactiferous duct opens in the nipple or in the areola uh, on the surface of the skin. So this superficial fascia, we'll study it in details in topographic anatomy, forms suspensory ligament for the mammary gland or Cooper's ligament, which fixes, attaches the mammary gland to the clavicle. And so here you can see it. So, oh yes, here you can see it better, how this from the uh, lobules, yes, this secretion means milk, yes, goes to the lactiferous ducts, and this lactiferous ducts opens in the nipple. In the nipple. Okay. So here you can see that, uh, yes, it functions mainly during lactation. It, in normal cases, it must function during lactation only. And during lactation, lobules, they get enlarged, yes, and they start to produce milk. Actually, uh, within first... Um, 24 to 48 hours, it's not milk yet, it's just colostrum. We will study it in uh, obstetrics later. And so after that, it is breast milk. And in this, during this time, memory gland significantly increases its size. Yes. Yes. And it's, it excretes milk to the areola. Okay, so here you can see how many additional ducts are formed in during active phase or during lactation, yes? Like it makes like a very big tree, each lobule. And in an inactive phase, mainly um, there is just adipose tissue around these glands, around the lobules of mammary gland. Here you can see it again. Changes in non-pregnant women, how it looks like, uh, how it looks like during pregnancy, especially very close to the moment of the childbirth. And in lactating women during lactation, you see this um, alveola, alveoli, they are very well developed. Okay. So, uh, actually, that is all uh, I wanted to tell you during this lecture and actually during the whole first year. I really hope that you gain a knowledge within this year. I hope that it will help you somehow in your future. And uh, I wish I wish you, yes, good luck with your exams and I wish you to spend your vacations well. And uh, see you in August.